Great to have you with us today for another Creditor Watch webinar. We're recording. I think everyone can hear us. Claire's with us as well. Give a bit of an introduction and we will get straight into it. Looking forward to it. So today we are having a, uh, a fantastic discussion. It's been one of the um, one of the most sought after actually webinars um, that have come through sort of Q&A and, and various people that we're talking to, um, customers, but also those outside of uh, our customer base as well. And ultimately, we've got the best person in the business for us right now who will uh, who will be able to talk talk with us about ATO tax defaults, um, the process that has been through it, the benefits of it, and um, and also some of the results as a result of uh, the information coming through as well. Here we go camera on. That's better. I think everyone knows enough about Creditor Watch now. You want to get into the detail as always if you've got any questions specifically about the product um, or the products I should say you can jump on the website creditorwatch.com.au we've got a fantastic new website that went live a couple of months ago um, there's a huge product suite in there that you can actually look through and uh, delve into these products that you on the screen in a little bit more detail and some of the key highlights that I always like to talk about, what, what sort of sets us apart, why is credit watch important? And why are we able to uh, ultimately put together not only our products, but, but importantly, our monthly business risk index, which is looking at you know, the financial health of not only individual businesses, but also industries and regions as well. And that, that, that data comes from two data sources, what we call big data, and, and common data. So the common data is ASIC information, um, some of the ATO information, court actions, etc. And then the more unique information that we have is the 55,000 plus customers who are contributing information, be it through age trial balance uploads, defaults, inquiries, etc. 90% of those customers are unique to Creditor Watch. Um, and as a result of that, the, the insights that we're able to generate from that uh, is not available anywhere else. Now, a proper welcome, Claire O'Neill, assistant. Um, it's debt and lodgement, I believe, integrity at the ATO. Claire, is that correct? Do I get that right? Correct. Yes, you have. Excellent. Thank you. And and ultimately today we're, we're going to talk about this ATO defaults and I'm going to remove the slides in, in, in a second just so we've uh, we can see one another a bit better and we're not no one's distracted by what's on the screen but essentially um, defaults went live and, and I should actually update this and caveat by saying we're not the only credit bureau anymore as far as I understand so maybe Claire can provide uh, confirmation of that shortly but essentially, there's, there's been a huge effort by, by a number of uh, non-government, but also government and, and um, public servants and, and, and people at the ATO and people like Claire, who've done a huge amount of work to ultimately get to this point where the ATO is able to lodge tax defaults with credit reporting bureaus. Um, the legislation was ultimately passed in, in 2019, known as uh, Disclosure of Business Tax Debts formerly known as Transparency of Tax Debt. Um, there was certainly an appetite, I believe, to, to, to get it published sooner than where we find ourselves now um, in 2022. But as we know, um, COVID came along and, and, and further disrupted um, this great piece of legislation. But the most important thing is, you know, the hard yards have been done. We are live with this data. And ultimately, the ATO is able to register these tax debts against um, commercial debtors that have an ABN, where the tax debt or debts is at least $100,000 and overdue by more than 90 days, where the entity is not engaging with the ATO and where there isn't an active complaint with the Inspector General of Taxation Ombudsman. Have I missed anything there, Claire? No, that, that's a good summary. Excellent, all right. So what I'm going to do is jump out there and we should be able to just see one another a little bit better and, and have a conversation about what is actually going on and what we're seeing um, as a result of it. So was there anything additional that you wanted to add there that I've sort of uh, introduced and, and spoken about? 
Um, well, I, I thought before we get into disclosure of the tax and information to credit reporting bureaus more specifically, would it be worthwhile just to give a, a quick kind of insight into the landscape more broadly of the ATO's debt approach and just what we're doing to, to try to recover debts, particularly after the last two years? So that as, would be as you fantastic. said, yeah, cool. Well, as you said, last two years, obviously, the pandemic happened um, and that, that followed obviously the, the very devastating bushfires that started at the end of 2019 as well. And so really we had a very long extended period as, as everyone on this webinar would know, where we reduced the volumes of our firmer or stronger actions for very good reasons, um, as did many organisations. And so the last couple of years, our posture has been very much about helping and assisting taxpayers um, where they need that help and assistance without doing as many of our normal firmer or stronger action activities. Um, so a big focus of the ATO at the moment, um, again, like other organisations coming out of the pandemic is looking to restart and we have restarted a lot more of those firmer actions. Um, what I want to be clear about though is that our help and assistance posture for the last two years, it's not that that's gone away. So it's not that we're no longer offering help and assistance and now we're just going hard. Help and assistance is always on offer and is always um, the, the, the first point of call for our engagement with taxpayers. But what we're really doing now, sorry, <coughs> apologies, apologies, lose, lose my voice. Um, what we're really doing now is just following through with taxpayers who have not responded despite our offers of help and assistance. Um, so there are some firmer actions that have restarted. That includes things like garnishes, things like direct to penalty notices, um, some of our legal actions. And of course, now we are in a position where we can start acting on that legislation that was passed a couple of years ago to allow us to disclose tax debt information to credit reporting bureaus. Um, we're very conscious though that after two years of lower activity with firmer actions, it wouldn't be appropriate to just restart that at the same levels as we were prior the pandemic without fair warning and opportunity for the community to engage. And so we've had a very, very big focus and looking at different ways to raise awareness in the community about our different activities. So with disclosure, for instance, um, even though we've got the law, we can start doing it. Um, we thought it fair and reasonable to do as much as we can to let the community know that this power is now available and we are intending to start using it. So, for instance, earlier this year, we wrote to all businesses in Australia whose tax debt was eligible potentially for disclosure. We wrote to them personally to let them know, hey, this new law was passed. We are now in a position where we're going to start using it. Your debt as it stands today, is actually eligible for that disclosure. But before we get to that stage, we want you to be aware of that and we want to give you the opportunity to engage with us. So very big focus on raising awareness. Um, and we've had really good responses to that. So I can let you know that um, since we started that letter campaign a few months ago, the pool of businesses whose tax debts were eligible for disclosure has already shrunk by about 30% because some of those businesses have taken action, which is what we want, right? Um, we're That's interested it. in- I'm a taxpayer myself, both personally and as a Absolutely. company, we're yeah. Absolutely, we've had um, tax payments come in, so, so quite a large number of actual payments, um, but by far and away, the biggest response we've had has just been in payment plans. So businesses who have not been engaged with us for a number of years got our letter, um, or in, in many cases we followed up with a phone call, saw that disclosure is something we can now do and talk to us about how to set up a payment plan. And we've got about $2 billion worth of debt that was not being actively managed in this population that is now under an active payment plan. So again, as you say, Patrick, you know, for all of us as taxpayers, that is a fantastic response. Um, we're interested in disclosing those businesses who are genuine credit risks. So if a business is not a credit risk, they've just been late in paying or they've been choosing not to pay, but they're actually not a credit risk, then we just want them to engage with us, demonstrate that they're not a credit risk, make a payment, go into a payment plan, then we know they're not a risk and we can move on to looking at some other businesses. 
Yeah, and that and on that point is a really good one to make. And there's two points I want to make. One is an analogy that I've been using about um, the sort of forewarning that's that's being provided, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But for, for that one, you know, far too often, um, you know, we, we get calls from um, from customers who say, "Oh, you know, we've been trading with this company. There's no negative information. They've been paying their debts, and all of a sudden they get wound up." You know, that, that's a conversation I've had for for 12 years. You know, since since I've started at Credit Watch on day one, you know, and, and if we had have known that there was an ATO debt, then, um, you know, we, we would have reduced our exposure, moved to COD or, or you know, cut, cut supply. So, so that, that really is a, you know, the, the biggest practical benefit for businesses out there. And, um, and, and we look forward to, you know, hearing the success stories as a result of that, because it just puts a huge amount of pressure on the supply chain up and down when, when one company falls over, you know, everyone else, all the other creditors all of a sudden are under pressure and, and, and ultimately their creditors are under pressure and they all fall over. The, the, the tax office makes less money because no one pays their tax back, right? No one makes payments. So, so yeah, re really, really beneficial there. And and just to your point about that sort of forewarning, I, I, I talk about um, the analogy of uh, I've got a, th a three-year-old and a five-year-old, two little girls. They're still little. I play hide and seek with them and I make sure that they know that I'm coming to find them so I don't, you know, find them all of a sudden and scare them, you know. So I, and I, I kind of, you know, use that analogy as as to how the, uh, the the ATO has been communicating with the community, with businesses, with, with, with uh, you know, tax paying companies that, hey, we're coming, it's coming, I'm walking down the, you know, I'm walking down the hall now, I'm coming into the bedroom, I'm going to look under the bed. So you've given, you're giving I every- I really like that. <laughs> Giving every opportunity for uh, for people to know they can't they can't act surprised if all of a sudden there is a um uh, you know a, a tax default lodged against them um which is, which is and hearing some of those wins that you're getting I think you said thirty percent um you know more engagement or payments being made from that tax pool you know is is huge and and I think you know unless you've been um, living under a rock, um, you know, the, the the government needs money, a lot more money coming into its coffers at the moment as well. So um, that, that's a that, that's a that's a real, real positive. Um, what what we might stay on on the topic of uh, of, of, of tax defaults. Um, we don't have to talk specific numbers, but you know, are, are we still in a sort of ramp up period, would you say, in, in terms of in terms of lodging them? Yeah, I, I would. I'd still describe it as yeah, very much um, ramp up. Um, so we started small and we started issuing formal intent to disclose notices at very low volumes towards the end of last year. So just for everyone on the line, um, under the legislation, we have to give a business a formal written warning that their debt is about to potentially be disclosed and they've got 28 days from receiving that correspondence to take action. Um, importantly, and this goes again to that point about awareness, receiving an intent to disclose notice is never the first time that the business would have heard from us about their debt. There would have been letters, attempts to make phone calls, etc. previously. Um, but these intent to disclose notices, as I said, we started issuing them at low volumes last year, um, low volumes deliberately to test the system, but also to test the market response because it was you know, coming out of COVID, we needed to get the balance right with our posture and test, is this the right time to start that activity? Um, the responses I've already said from businesses themselves who we've targeted has been very positive, but more so the response from the community more broadly from different stakeholders and industry groups who've been very supportive of us starting to act on this measure. So we've been able to start ramping up um, and increasing the volume of those intent to disclose notices. Um, that number has gone up quite significantly. The number who've, of businesses who still haven't taken action after getting one of those formal written notices um, at this stage is still quite small because, you know, I talked about that awareness letter campaign we ran earlier and the really good response. So out of the pool who didn't respond to that letter, we've now moved to telephone attempts out of that where there's still no response, we then move to that formal intent to disclose notice. And we're finding that businesses who haven't responded prior to getting there to that formal notice, when they get that formal notice, that does trigger really good response as well. So then the number that flow through who still don't take action after getting that formal response, it's actually today still quite small. And so the number of, of businesses and um, it, it does fluctuate week to week, so I won't put a particular number on it. But the number of businesses whose debts are disclosed today, it, it is quite small. 
Um, but that's a reflection of the good responses we've been getting. Um, but what I would say is that because it is in ramp up, we're making our way through that population. And I expect by the end of the year, we'll have got through many, many more of those clients. And so the number of clients that is just whose debts are disclosed to a credit reporting bureau, that number is going up bit by bit, week by week. Yeah, that's that's a great update to get. And and look, it must be quite um, challenging at the moment, despite the fact that we've you know had this this COVID period. I know that we're still in it. I'm not saying we're out of it, but you know that I, mm. I think people, most most people fundamentally say you know we, we we came out of the COVID period at the beginning of this you know calendar year. Um, you know the ATO biggest creditor in Australia. You know probably the Team Australia, um, you know, leader along, alongside the big four banks in terms of, you know, nursing companies through supporting them and, and ultimately, you know, letting them back out into the wild as, as, as the economy opened back up. We're now in a position where um, the, the economy is, you know, is going to be, you know, struggle, uh, you know, it's challenging conditions out there, um, a lot of uncertainty again. Do, do, do you feel that that might slow down the ramp up a bit and, and for me the way I've always explained it is let's get the ramp up right the last thing we want to do is is mess it up in, in the first couple of weeks not that any of us ever thought we would mess it up but let's just get it right the hard work has been Absolutely. done let's it straight away so do, do you sort of see just the normal the normal ramp up happening or do you think the current you know economic conditions will slow it down um, I overall I actually think that we'll continue on the trajectory we are and the reason I say that is because I think we're getting very good at understanding which businesses we're engaging with are actually still thriving despite the challenges of the last couple of years and despite the challenges today. And we're also getting really good at understanding which, which businesses are actually in, in need of help and assistance and who are wanting to engage. Um, I think as well, we've got to remember the intent of this measure that allows us to disclose tax debts to credit reporting bureaus. Um, it can certainly feel like, and it is, a high impact action to that business. You know, it has a big impact on their credit score and therefore their whole, their whole business operations. But the intent of it is not to be punitive. It will feel like it's being a punishment to some of those businesses, but the intent is not to be punitive. The intent is business protection. And I think what we all recognise it is that in the economy at the moment, whether it's you know supply chain issues, the labour market constraints, interest rates, cost of living, there's all these enormous pressures. And what that means is that now more than ever, I think businesses need consumer protection. And so my interest with this measure is not about punishing businesses who might not be complying with their tax obligations. My interest is about thinking about all the businesses out there who are trying to make informed decisions so they can protect themselves. And we have a role to play where if a business is demonstrating to us evidence that they are a high credit risk, there's an interest in terms of community value for me disclosing that debt in appropriate circumstances. So I don't think we're going to be um, slowing down. I don't think we're going to be like speeding up either. I think the trajectory will be what it is. And I think it all comes down to making sure that when we are disclosing it is in those right circumstances. Um, the, there's a lot of criteria spelled out in the legislation, but, but my team and I have just got three overriding principles before we disclose someone's debt. And the first one is, are we sure that they know about the debt? Are we absolutely sure? So it's not a surprise. Um, are we sure that they know about the potential for disclosure? And have we given them ample and reasonable opportunity to demonstrate to us that they're not a credit risk? As long as a business meets those three criteria, then irrespective of the broader economy around us at the moment, we would be looking to disclose that information to a credit reporting bureau. Yeah, fantastic. And, and that'll be really welcomed by, you know, everyone who's, who's listening here. You know, the vast majority, I would say, 99% are going to be you know, credit managers, finance managers, CFOs, etc. Those who are, who are extending credit to, to other businesses, and they and they want they want that blind spot filled. You know, they want to be able to see around the corner, to to see it. And and um, yeah, by 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 you know enforcing it on one business, you, you're ultimately pr pr uh, protecting you know dozens of, of of other businesses, which is which is really important. And, and they're they're the ones who are ultimately doing the right thing. So um, that's you know, it exactly. 
say that they're not doing the right thing, uh, but ultimately, you know, if, if, if you're not, you know, you're not operating a, a business that's, that's solvent or, or, or can trade, then it's, uh, you know, you shouldn't be taking on debt and, and putting other businesses um, at risk. Um, I, I want to talk about um, the, the, the the lodge and pay integrity branch review. The, so your department, ultimately, you know what what it, what it is that that you do, and specifically, you know, other projects um, that you're working on. And yeah. I have no doubt questions on on the ATO uh, de, de, defaults itself, and we can come back to those. But you know, I'm quite keen to hear, you know, what else is it that that's being worked on at the moment um, within within your space. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so the integrity branch within Lodge and Pay, the word integrity with respect to our branch is um, referencing the integrity of the whole system. So at a really high level, my branch is responsible for looking for intelligence and indicators that something in the broader system is not quite working and in some cases taking direct action to plug that gap and to strengthen the integrity. And our work on disclosure is a really good example of that. And you referred to it as a, as a bit of a blind spot. So that's a, a gap in the integrity of the system. So we're taking action to, to plug that gap. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the other work in, in my space um, that all, all fits under that banner. So my branch also looks after all of the complaints for all of service delivery in the ATO. So that's lodge and pay matters, but also all of our client accounting matters, um, income tax processing, et cetera, complaints you know, often being the most valuable piece of intelligence you can get that might tell you something in the system isn't working um, or that there's a perception, at least, from clients that something is not working. Um, I also have the Tax Integrity Centre where we get the community tip-offs, um, more informally known as the Dobbin line. Um, and if any of you have seen some of the media over the weekend about the shadow economy, I had a colleague, Peter Holt, doing a lot of interviews and media last week yeah, about the shadow economy and we talked a lot in his messages about the value that we get from community intelligence. So members of the community who are coming forward to us with intelligence about some part of non-compliance that another party may be um, complicit with or perceived to be complicit with and we act on that intelligence. Um, we do have a number of other teams as well that looks at, at really bespoke work type for some client groups where the threshold of integrity is even higher. So, for instance, um, oh, oh, one example I'll give you is, is ATO employees and contractors, our own obligations. Obviously, you know, our threshold for ATO employees is even higher than the general population. We expect everyone in the ATO to be compliant with their obligations. So my team will look at any cracks in the gap of that as well. And if we see anyone who whose um, lodgements or payments are falling behind, we'll, we'll work with them to lift the integrity of that population. Um, along with disclosure, another project that we're working on is called the Government Payment Program. And this is where we're working with other government agencies at a federal level to look at payments that are made out from government to service providers who provide services on behalf of the government. So for instance, it could be um, family daycare providers, it could be training institutions, it could be uh, uh, NDIS service providers. So businesses who are operating as private businesses, but they're getting some kind of payment from government to provide that service to the community. And we're doing work across government um, under that government payments program to look at, well, how can we actually join the dots? And how can we make sure that on one hand, businesses aren't getting some money from government to provide a service, but on the other hand, they might not be complying with their tax and super obligations. So how do we just strengthen the integrity around that? Um, and, and I think to my point earlier about coming out of the, the COVID pandemic and, and what we've really seen, and as you said, Patrick, as well, we're not quite out of it. We talk about it as being, you know, post-COVID, but COVID is definitely rearing its head again at the moment. Um, what it really tells us is that there are some parts of the economy, economy that might be thriving at any point in time. There's other parts of the economy that might be struggling. Um, our job is to just offer tailored solutions, offer everyone help and assistance, but to, to make sure that those who don't follow through that we do take firmer, stronger actions. Um, and my branch is responsible, I suppose, for, for pulling together all of that broader intelligence that just helps us understand 
taxpayer behaviour and risks and indicators of, of gaps in the integrity of the system and then trying to improve it. Um, yeah, that's probably just a quick summary of my branch overall without going into too much detail. What's going on in your branch at the moment then? Heaps. Um, <laughs> from a technology perspective, assuming there's, you know, I know what it was like utilising, you know, the, some of the ATO websites anyway, and I think, you know, it's, it's come a long way, but the, the, the amount of um, investment in, in, in those, in those uh, platforms must be, must be immense to support all of that work that's, that's going on at the moment. So that's um, yeah, a bit of kudos from me because I'm probably one of the first to jump and scream when I have a bad experience with a, uh, with a, with a government department at any time. So, so that's a <laughs> well, I think um, whether it's looking at disclosure, whether it's looking at that government payments program I mentioned, whether it's things like single touch payroll and, and all of you are probably familiar with, with that as well. Um, these are game changing system enhancements or, 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 or you know, things that are strengthening the integrity of your system that could not be possible without digital services. Imagine trying to exchange the level of detail that we're sharing across government and now sharing with you know, yourself, Patrick, and sharing with other entities and like with single touch payroll, the amount of data we're getting from employers now with every pay cycle, none of that could happen in an analog paper world. Um, we rely on digital to make all that happen, um, but hand in hand with that goes trying to make our services for taxpayers as easy as possible so they can do as much online with us as possible, preferably without the need to actually talk to us or interact with us, just do it all self-service online where possible. Yeah, yeah, great. And I might just pick up a point there. Um, you speak about you spoke about data. Obviously, the, the data in, in terms of the, the tax defaults re really valuable from a, from a credit risk perspective. Um, do, do you see data becoming more uh, freely provided to either the public or, or companies like Creditor Watch, depending on you know what area they're in? You know, like the single touch payroll data is incredibly important. Um, I believe the ATO is also responsible for for ANZIC, so the industry classification information. Yeah, with the ma making that Making that more readily available, do you think that, that that's something that, that will come or it's very challenging? It, it, it is very challenging because whilst data is enormously powerful and we want to harness it, it always has to be balanced with that need for security and privacy and, you know, and due process. Um, yeah. And so whilst there's enormous um, intelligence and, and, you know, the, the opportunities of what we could do with data, um, we always have to weigh up the benefit that comes with the potential risk that you could have a degradation in privacy, security and ultimately community confidence. I think when it comes to tax data, the legislation that keeps our tax data private is very, very tight. Um, yeah. And that's why even... As you would know, Patrick, our ability to disclose tax debts to credit reporting bureaus um, wasn't just a simple administrative change. There was an entire legislative um, change that needed to be orchestrated, which was quite complex. Um, and it's it's very, very tightly written so that um, there can be no ambiguity about the circumstances in which we can disclose this data and the circumstances when we can't. Um, and that makes it it, yeah, very, very strict. Um, that could be perceived then as a challenge or a barrier, but I would describe it instead as something that gives certainty the, to the community because at least the community then, they know exactly the circumstances in which we could disclose their information and that should give them assurance that, um, yeah, we're, that we can't just administratively ourselves decide to go down a different direction. So, um, Sometimes whilst we make the rules really tight, that can give a lot of assurance to the community, which I think helps to just continue to build confidence. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And, and if nothing else, it's a, good, um, it's a good case study for the fact that the data can be used, obviously, for good and, and um, you know, that the, the ATO Absolutely. has the ability to work with, work, work with partners to, to be able to utilise it. But um, yeah, I think hopefully it's a, it sort of kicks off the ability to start looking at, oh, what else is there? Obviously, anything with personal information or tax information is is very unlikely to be shared. But I think even, you know, sort of anonymised or industry or region specific information um, can, can yeah. be a significant community as well. Yeah. And, and I think, um, and I'm not just talking about 
um, information like what we disclosed to, to credit reporting bureaus, but any other data any government agency holds, um, when the case can be made for more sharing and more transparency, when that case can be made best is when the case is being made by the community. So when it's the, yep. a sector of the community saying, we need this shared for reasons X, Y, or Z, um, that will always ultimately, I think, lead, lead to a more potentially favourable um, consideration of, well, what's the need there? Because if it's the community themselves saying this data should be shared, well, then that suggests that there's going to be a, a very real community benefit. Yeah, especially in this sort of open data world where where people are, you know, uh, ownership is now coming back to the consumer rather than the, uh, the the holder of the data. So yeah, that's a it's a really interesting Absolutely. space to watch. Um, we've we've got lots of lots of questions coming through, and before I jump into them, I'll I'll take the uh, opportunity to ask my my own question. Do do you do you see you know the um the sort of thresholds that are there, the hundred thousand um, dollars, the the ninety days, it's probably the hundred thousand dollars to be honest. Do you, do you see that that coming down? And and I'll sort of preface that by saying that I think the majority, I think the average debt that's been lodged so far is probably closer to sort of five hundred, maybe seven hundred thousand. There's been some in the you know million plus. So it's it's not like for anyone listening, it's not like they're only lodging those at the sort of you know close to the hundred thousand mark. Do you sort of see that as a starting point, and then you know it, it'll get reviewed in a year or two, and, and ultimately start to come down? Yeah, it, it's really hard to, to speculate on that in some ways. Um, what I would say is that every government program will get reviewed. And when a review happens, the one thing that is reviewed is always the settings. So as a public servant, I would say that would I expect the settings for disclosure to be reviewed sometime in the future? Yes, I would. Um, but I would say that about all of our programs. Um, as to whether the threshold actually changes at some point because it is enshrined in law, that will be a matter for government of the day um, to consider a law change. And I think ultimately any um, appetite or consideration for that will probably be um, driven largely by community appetite, exactly what I was saying before about if the community starts to say actually the 100,000 threshold um, is actually not giving us the degree of benefit we need, and we need a change, then uh, potentially that, that could drive a conversation. But from my perspective, um, I wouldn't speculate on whether the threshold might change or not, other than to say it would be reasonable to say we will be reviewed at some point. Yeah, and I think I'm sure there's... But it's probably, it's probably, the, um, it's probably the number one question I get asked though, Patrick, so I'm conscious of people's interest in it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good point. I'm sure there's good insights that that, that you have around, you know, whether 100,000 is, you know, is a lot or not, and whether it leads to, you know, a wind up or not. So, so I'm sure that'll be taken into consideration. And definitely um, the case. Definitely the case. If if that's the if that's the 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 number one question, I'll give you what's probably the 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 number two question for 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 us is around the removal of uh of a default and and. Um, do, do you want to just sort of talk about the, the process and how that works just to, to educate people? Yeah, sure. So when a business no longer meets the criteria for disclosure, so their debt amount owing drops underneath 100,000, um, they might have entered a payment plan, they might have lodged a, a complaint with the Inspector General, and there's a range of other um, smaller criteria as well, then yeah, the, the minute they don't meet the criteria, we have to completely expunge their record from the, the Credit Reporting Bureau. Um, we, at the moment, we have a weekly data share with the Credit Reporting Bureaus that we share this information with. Um, and so we will include in that update any information about businesses who, since their information has been disclosed, no longer meet the criteria. And then there's a couple of days turnaround um, where the Credit Reporting Bureau will need to completely remove that information. Um, but I think it is quite different to how some of the other adjustments would work for some other information that's shared with you. Um, in that right, Pat Patrick? Because in this case, we're kind of talking about a complete expungement. That's right. Traditionally, a, you know, a default would be would be lodged by a, for example, a, you know, a trade creditor against a debtor, and then if it was paid, it, it would most of the time be updated to, you know, settled. So so it. That, in, that that continuity is really important. I think it stays on there. Sorry, it does stay on there for, for up to five years. Um, mm. So they they had an instance where they weren't paying 
but you know you can then see that there's you know that they have been paying since then. Um, it, it is a really interesting one, and we won't get into the sort of um, reasoning behind it. You know, I think most people understand it. The fact that, that we can get them in the first place is the most important. Uh, in time, I'm sure that's something that'll be be up for review, but it'll also be really interesting to see how many actually come off, etc. So um, that that's that's uh, that's still got a way on, on that topic, I think. Um, yeah. Just jumping into some some questions. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to read through them as I as I go as I go through them. Uh, here we go. Yeah, another another popular question. Um, when will ATO winding at, uh, winding up applications recommence? And I believe they've already uh, started. That. There's probably a, there's been a couple. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. There, there definitely has. Um, I probably wouldn't expect our activity in that space to return to pre-COVID levels, maybe o until over the course of the next year. It'll take some time for us to start working through that. Um, just because of the, 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 the leading time, the process you need to go through to, you know, really understand if a business is at that stage and whether that's appropriate action to take. So it's not something that we would jump from, you know, zero right to that point. And because we've only been restarting some of our firmer actions over the last little while, it will take some time for that population to, to wash through. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're right, Patrick, and I don't have the number at hand, but we definitely have been doing some activity in that space. So it's not like it is yet to restart. It has restarted. I just think it'll take some time for those numbers to, to ramp up again. Yeah, and, and there'll be a direct correlation then between um, that ramping up and the, the increase in insolvencies ultimately, right? Because, you know, I would I would suggest that the ATO is probably the biggest contributor to, to insolvencies on a month-to-month -month basis. Yeah, we... Um, yeah, and, and just to clarify that, because I, I hear that comment a lot that, you know, we're the, the biggest driver of insolvencies, but um, just to clarify for everyone on the webinar, um, even if I look at like pre-COVID levels, uh, I think it's fair to say we're one of, we're definitely one of the more frequent instigators of wind-up activity, um, but still the minority. So still the majority that take place will not have been instigated by the ATO, but the number that is instigated by the ATO might be more than others, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's a good way, good way of putting it. Um, okay, that, that's yeah, that's really good to know because I think that's for me outside of the the ATO tax defaults, um, uh, companies, people, media as well. Media is always asking, obviously, um, you know, when, when will insolvencies get back to, to pre-COVID levels? You know, will they go above? And and you know, the the big um, the big sort of uh, Elephant in the room is is, is ultimately the ATO, but also you know the, the big four banks getting into that that pre-COVID collection rhythm. So um, it's good to hear that because I think that answers a lot of questions. And we've also been of the opinion that it'll be a sustained increase rather than you know all of a sudden you go from a absolutely. Of months. And and it might be that um there might be some insolvency actions um, triggered in the community as a result of something that that we may have um, taken action with but we might not have actually taken insolvency action. So what I mean by that is that in disclosure, we have had a couple of examples where we have contacted a business about um, the potential for the disclosure and the business, like that has triggered them to make that sometimes difficult decision to recognise that they've been trading insolvent and they actually start their own wind up activity. So we haven't actually got to the insolvency stage ourselves in the ATO, but something else we've done in engagement with the taxpayer has triggered a, a set of other dis, um, decisions on their behalf, if that makes sense. Yep, yep, that's that's a good point. Um, this this should be, I think, a fairly easy one to answer, given given you've stated you know you're, you're in ramp up, but essentially there would be um, entities out there that have yet to fall into your sort of bucket of, of sending yep. a letter that technically fit the the, the disclosure. Um, variables is that correct that that's correct that's correct um, what I'm expecting is that over the course of the next plus six to 12 months though um, I will get very close to hundred percent saturation of formal intent to disclose notices so putting aside sort of the general awareness letters and phone calls the actual formal written notice to say you've got 28 days before we disclose yeah I'm expecting over the next six to 12 months that 
everyone who meets that criteria will have got one of those formal notices. So at the moment, it's definitely true that not all of them have got to that stage. So um, I'm expecting, yeah, that the numbers will will yeah follow that trajectory and and we'll be making our way through the population. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That that makes sense. Um, and I'll clarify a question here for probably for me. Will the ATO uh, will the defaults only be available on Credit Watch? They were for a short period of time. I understand that. Um, there's obviously two other bureaus um, have, have signed the deed of arrangement and I believe one other now starting to publish them. So um, there's two others now publishing. Um, right. So the third who had joined has started just, just in the last week or so. Um, we have a number of other smaller um, rep credit reporting entities who are also talking to us about possibly coming on board. So there's gen uh, genuinely a lot of interest from the credit reporting market. I think now that they've seen, um, like yourselves, you know, Patrick taking that first step with us and it, and it's starting to ramp up and gaining interest, um, there are more looking to come on board. Yeah, great. Um, Claire, if you just wanted Creditor Watch to be a reseller of that on your behalf to those smaller entities to save the effort, <laughs> I can look after them for you. Um, and then, We've got to thank you already. Thank you, Mel. And then uh, um, another comment here saying I'm off to pay my taxes as soon as possible. Um, thank just you. Let me check my, my other device to get uh, the other questions. There was, a, I think, a couple of questions that might have come in earlier, but otherwise we're almost at the end. Um, no, I think we've... Uh, no, I think we've actually answered them all. There, there, there was a there was a, a, a sort of question around Phoenix activity. Um, I'm not sure if it sort of falls into into your remit, um, but the, the way I sort of look at it, it, it it's uh, it's not really a, a connection to, to the ATO tax defaults. Ultimately, you're looking at you're looking at one entity and, and one entity only, right? This doesn't carry over to a a, a legal yeah, at, and at a point in time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one thing I'll to that is within the report, so, so Credit Watch is obviously publishing these um, tax defaults now. They're, they're in the credit reports. If you look up a company and, and um, there, is a, there is a tax default, you'll obviously see it. Um, but on that sort of phoenixing question, or at least what we call, you know, cross directorships, um, if you look at a company and it says, you know, Patrick Coughlin, for example, um, there's, a, there's a tax default against one of his other companies that will come up within the cross directorship section. So that's probably one way to, to answer the question if they've had a, a tax default, either current or in the past, um, uh, that, that cross directorship uh, information is, is a real benefit to be able to understand, um, you know, or link it to phoenixing anyway. Mm. Um, I think that is, that's everything that's come through. Um, Sorry, someone's picked up on this, doing a sales job for me, as, assuming that, that the monitoring and alerts will also pick up on the ATO tax defaults. Yes, that is correct. So you can find the, the, the default on the, uh, on the credit report or if you're monitoring an entity and then a, a tax default is registered against that entity, we will send you an email alert to let you know about that um, tax default as well. Um, that is all of them and, and we're kind of right on time as well. I believe as well. So I don't want to don't want to keep too much time from Claire. As you heard before, she's got plenty on at the moment. So Claire, I, I just wanted to say a really, really big thank you um, for joining us today. It, it's great to, to continue with this uh, awareness generation um, that yourself, your team, and the ATO have been involved in. I think it's a fantastic um, initiative or, or piece of legislation, I should say. You know, don't don't take it for granted. Anyone who's, you know. Uh, looking to, to utilise it, relying on it, et cetera. There's a huge, huge amount of work that has gone into this. So it's fantastic to mm. see, um, you know, government and, and legislation and, and democracy, et cetera, in, in process and, and coming through. It's probably the, the, the biggest improvement in commercial credit reporting in, um, I don't know, I, I'd say as long as I've been involved in it. So well over 12 years. So Claire, a big hearty thank you on, on behalf of myself, Credit Watch and, and all of our customers who are looking forward to, to having that blind spot uh, filled for them. Thanks very much for it and, and thank you for joining us today as well. Thank you. Um, always happy to chat about this and so yeah thank you for the opportunity and for the platform. Appreciate it. Excellent. All right everyone well thanks very much again for joining us today for another Creditor Watch 
uh, webinar. Claire, again, final thank you to everyone who's signed in. Much appreciated. Keep an eye out for our next webinar, which there's always something coming up with Creditor Watch. Um, in the meantime as well, jump onto creditorwatch.com.au. We have a brand new news hub, which has got a huge amount of information, um, whether it's legislative changes like um, the, the topic we discussed today, product initiatives, et cetera. You can also access all the business risk index information. There's plenty happening across all industries and regions that we report on that came out um, on the 12th of July, I believe it was. So jump on there, have a look. Until next time, thank you very much and uh, be safe. See you later.